Welcome back to Mythic for Foundry. In this video, we'll look at combat in the Mythic for Foundry system, and the quality of life features included to help make combat a bit quicker and easier to handle. Let's start by opening Chief's Actor Sheet, then clicking Prototype Token in the bar at the top. This will let us set up some defaults, so we don't have to edit token values every time we bring him onto a scene. Let's set his token name to Sierra117. Then, we can set his display name to Always for Everyone, and set his token disposition to friendly. Then, we'll check link actor data if it isn't already checked. Next, we'll head to the image tab where we can change the token image if we want a different token from his portrait. Then, we can set the size of the token based on grid units. Since Chief is a large size character, I'll increase both the width and the height of his token to two. Finally, we'll head to resources and select always for everyone when displaying bars. Bar 1, by default, is set to Wounds, and Bar 2 is left open. You can change these around however you like. I'm going to set his second bar to Shields. When you're finished, click Update Token to save the changes. Now, we'll drag the Chief out of the Actors section and onto the scene. By right-clicking, we'll be able to view some token options and update his bars. I'm going to assume you know how to use these and skip right to starting a combat. In the Combat Tracker tab on the right-hand sidebar, we're going to click the plus button to create a new combat. Back on Chief's token, I'll click the Sword and Shield icon to set him as ready for combat, making him appear in the sidebar. To roll initiative, we just need to click the D20 icon to automatically roll his initiative and sort him into the combat. We can see his initiative roll in the chat messages here. The system will sort combatants by initiative result first, then handle tiebreakers using the sum of the combatant's agility modifier and mythic agility stat. If there is still a tie, it will compare the agility score itself to determine the winner. Back on the character sheet, we can see our weapons here in the summary section. Some buttons may be disabled, because we didn't select firing modes or load the weapons for the first time. We can do that now. Starting with the assault rifle, we'll set the fire mode to automatic. Next, we need to reload the magazine. You can edit this input by hand, or you can click the reload icon to put in a fresh, full magazine. You should see now that the attack buttons activate and display the number of attacks for the corresponding type of attack action. The number above the reload icon is the number of half actions it takes the user to reload that weapon. If it shows an R, then that weapon can be reloaded as a reaction if it's a pistol. Otherwise, it can be reloaded as a single half action. If it instead shows a T, as is the case for thrown weapons, there is no reload action. Clicking the reload icon for this weapon simply means you found more grenades to replenish those you've lost. Now, let's roll an attack. Click the button on the right for whatever type of attack action you're making. Let's do a full attack with the assault rifle. This will bring up a dialog box, where we can put in our circumstance modifiers for the attack just as with other tests we've rolled so far. I'll leave it at zero, and then click Roll. There we go. The sheet rolled 10 attacks, and is showing us the outcome of each. For each successful hit, it also gives us the damage and pierce, and the hit location. We also depleted our magazine by 10 shots. Let's make another full attack. And now, we'll make a half-action attack. Now, our magazine has seven shots left, and we no longer have enough rounds to perform a full attack. We can see this reflected in the full attack button, which capped itself at the number of rounds in our magazine. We can still make a complete half attack though, so let's make another one of those. Now our magazine has two shots left, which is less than the number we can make for a half attack, so we see that the button has capped itself as well. I'll roll one final half attack. Now our magazine is empty, and we can no longer make attacks with this weapon. Once we reload, we're ready for more. The number of attacks and the weapon's target will adjust automatically when you change the fire mode. Setting the fire mode to burst, we can see that the button values change to reflect the new fire mode, and the target increases by 10. When we attack with the weapon in burst, we can see that it batches damages into each half action. If we set the weapon to semi-auto, 
and fire again, it returns to one damage per attack. Now, let's throw a grenade. Grenades are unique in that they only allow a single toss, so the single attack button spans the entire column. The range is also showing how far the character can throw the weapon, based on its weight, as well as the blast and kill ranges in parentheses. So, let's throw the grenade. Success! We can see it rolling damage, but not addressing a hit location, since explosives target the lowest armor value. We can also see the weapon's special rules appearing as tags at the bottom of the chat message. Let's throw another grenade. Uh-oh, we missed. Don't fret, though. After all, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, and this does happen to be a hand grenade. Even on failed attack rolls, any weapon with the blast or kill special rules will still roll damage, and also give us an option to scatter. Let's see where this grenade landed. When we click scatter in the chat message, we see another dialog box appear. Here, there are three options. Degrees of failure, which should already contain the value from the roll. If it doesn't, just enter it yourself. The distance the thrower was from their intended target in meters is the second option. In this case, we'll say Chief was 25 meters away. Finally, we have a checkbox that tells the system that we're playing in a zero gravity environment, so it knows if it has to scatter along the z-axis as well. When we click roll, we'll hear the dice, and the result will populate, replacing the scatter link in the same chat window. It will provide arrow icons to show which direction the grenade scattered in, and then a number of meters showing how far. If in zero gravity, there will be a vertical bar symbol, and then another set of arrows, and a number, to show the z-axis scatter. Finally, let's put some special ammo in our assault rifle. I'm going to edit it using the edit icon, then change the ammunition to include BMJ-INS. This is Blamite Incendiary Ammo, so we can see the flame and needle special rules in action. The Blamite jacketed ammo is from the Warzone Rex Splat book, and isn't exactly canon, so this may or may not be allowed in your game. First, we'll deal with the modifications from the incendiary ammo. Let's reduce the base damage by 2, and the pierce by 1. Then, we'll scroll down and select the flame special rule, and set it to 1d5 if it isn't already. Now, let's deal with the Blamite jacketed ammo. We'll reduce the damage and pierce by a further two points. Then, check the needle special rule. For the needle value, Blamite jacketed rounds use needle X, where X is based on your fire mode. We're going to run the assault rifle in semi-auto this time, so that makes our X value equal to 3 plus 1, or 4. Back on the summary page, let's roll a full action attack with this bad boy. Success! As we can see, the flame and needle special rules rolled their damage, just in case they can be applied. In this case, they can be. We got enough successful hits to super combine, so we can apply the flame damage for setting them on fire, and also the needle damage for a super combine explosion. Now, we can attack, but what about when we're attacked? Here's an enemy elite, which just fired a salvo of shots at the chief with his plasma rifle. He managed to hit with five of them. Now, Chief would do well to dodge these with his evasion skill. Luckily, there's an easy way to roll batched evasions to make this easier. On the summary page of our character sheet, we'll click this evasion button in the weapons section. This will give us a dialog box with three options. The circumstance modifier, as every dialog box before has asked for. How many tests are being made? Here, we'll make one for each of the successful hits. The stacking penalty for each subsequent evasion test. This defaults to 10, but can be changed to match whatever the penalty is for your situation. If you're starting, having already performed some evasions earlier in this round, set the circumstance modifier to whatever penalty your first test should be this time around. The system will handle things from there. Let's roll. There we go. The sheet has rolled each of our evasions for us, providing the outcome of each for us to combat against the attack rolls. It looks like the chief managed to dodge three of these, but still took a few hits. Thankfully, he's got shields, armor, and a lot of wounds between him and death. That's it for this video. Now, you should be ready to run combats in the Mythic for Foundry system. If you have any questions, 
You can reach me in the Halo Mythic Discord server, where there's a channel dedicated to the development of and feedback on the Mythic for Foundry system. There, you can provide feedback, request features, or submit any bug reports. Be sure to check the GitHub repository, which I have linked in the description, before reporting a bug. Chances are, I may already know about it. Thanks for watching. Bye.